Hello, this is Elder Tehila Farwind, High Priestess of the Covenant of Open Mind, and you're watching Astrology 101. Hail and welcome. This time we'll be talking about the houses. Um, if you can remember back, we've so far covered the zodiacal signs and the flat wheel, and we've talked about the planets and where they fall um, and, and how to look those things up using an astronomy tool called Stellarium. In this one, we're going to talk about the houses. Um, so the houses are the um, 12 segments of the 360 degree circle uh, that is that is, you know, the ecliptic path. But um, when it comes to the houses, you don't consider the extra signs that sometimes fall in the ecliptic to be actual houses. So the actual houses are always limited to 12. Um, and that has to do with um, the cardinal fixed and mutable components of each element, right? So the modalities. Um, the modalities and the elements. That's what determines the energy of each of these houses. And there's still only 12 houses, even though there's now 14 signs on the ecliptic. Some of the houses are just split and um, include multiple signs. And that'll become obvious when we talk about the two houses that have that split. Uh, and people who've done astrology for a long time might hear this and be a little put off at first because now I'm using all these extra um, signs and planets. But... Um, but the house, the houses remain the same, and the houses are the most important part, right? So the houses determine um, how all of these energies really come together. So otherwise, you would just have disjointed energy here and there. So when we talk about the houses, we're really starting to bring all of the planets and sign locations in the chart together. And the reason for this is because the first house is called the rising sign. And many people will say that the most important sign is the sun sign, but that's not really true. The sun sign is your conscious self. It's how you want the world to see you, how you interact with the world. And that's important, but the rising sign is your true self, like who you are when no one is looking. It's your um, the essence of your soul. And it's always the sign that is rising in the east at the time of your birth. So it's often called the ascendant also. Uh, and it's usually in transit. So it's usually in the process of rising. And that's what goes in the first house. Um, it sometimes can be multiple signs, especially in the winter when like the path of the ecliptic is closer to the horizon. So it's more common that you'll have two winter signs rising at the same time. And if someone has two rising signs, then you just basically like split each house in half and, and every single sign is influenced by two houses and it becomes a very complicated chart to read. And the people that have that type of thing in their chart, I'm one of them, <laughs> for instance, um, tend to be very dynamic, hard to figure out type people. Um, so that just makes things more complicated. There are people who will ignore that and say that one sign is rising period, but um, I just I just think considering the cusp is really important. And we'll talk a bit more about cusps uh, in a minute, but um, but for now, note that each house has a modality that matches the sign that rules that house. And um, when you do the actual star chart, the, the sign that's in the rising house, that the rising sign may not be Aries, right? Aries is what goes in the first house. Normally, Aries rules the first house, but depending on what time of day you were born, it could be a different sign. And the houses are probably going to be consistent whether you get your data from an astrology tool, uh, which is usually how usually they have inaccurate uh, data when it comes to the location of the planets because they don't account for planetary precession, which is why we use an astronomy tool, Stellarium. We use like a scientific tool um, to get the planetary dates uh, data. But the rising sign is probably going to be consistent because um, that is. The, the houses are not affected by the location of the planets at all. The houses have to do with the angle that the Earth makes with the sun. And that's why, despite the dates shifting, because the planets are not where they seem, so someone might be born, you know, August 27th, say, and that's technically a Virgo, but their sun is probably in Leo, because now the 
um, the sun doesn't switch from Leo to Virgo until like the middle of September. So it's almost a month behind. Um, so their solar house would still be Virgo because the solar house is always the same. It's always 30 degrees of a 360, you know, it's always uh, exactly the same length between each and every solar house because that has to do with the angle that Earth is making with the sun. So the rising sign um, and the solar house are all related specifically to this component of astrology, to houses. And that's why they're not changed, they're not affected by the incorrect data that people tend to use when they're getting the planetary information, which is why you need the astrology tool. So, um, so that's a little bit of background on houses. And so the first house, like we said, represents the true self. It is the foundation of who you are and the first step uh, that happens inside of you when you seek to do anything. When you make any choice, when you act in any way, uh, it's going to be affected by this energy because the first house is really, you know, think of the energy of Aries, of cardinal fire. It's the foundation, the beginning of something. Um, so if you were to summarize this house in one sentence, then you could say this house is who you are. I am. Okay, that's the rising. That's the ascendant. Okay, so for the second house. The second house is ruled by Taurus. Uh, the planet is Venus. So I think it's a very loving, protective energy. Very fixed Earth. It's very strong and stable. So it represents your place of anchor and stability, the foundation of your life. So not the foundation of yourself. This is now the foundation of your life, right? So that's the progression. We go from I am to I possess. It's your finances, your possessions, um, the way that you interact with gathering things, in other words. Okay, second house. So now we're on to the third. The third house is ruled by Gemini, and the planet is Mercury, so mutable air. Okay, so we're talking about a very uh, changeable energy, something that... Um, this is what governs whether or not you go through fads and you know so if the sun is uh how do you feel how do you want to be seen how do you interact with the world this is like um the mode that that expression takes so the sun is how do i want to be seen and the third house is how do i go about being seen that way um so it's your self-expression presentation personality traits i express is the essential energy of this house and that's why you know it's mutable air so it changes all the time it changes with the wind um, so you may go through many phases of expression in your life and they'll be governed by the planets moving through the third house okay fourth house the fourth house this one's governed by cancer and the moon so it's very emotional it's cardinal water so it's it's the foundation of emotion really it's uh it's who do you want to be surrounded by? It describes the family, um, the parents, whether or not someone is extroverted or introverted and how badly do they need a community. So for, for instance, if they have Scorpio in the fourth house, then maybe they're not a big fan of community and they like to keep their secrets and, and they don't really get along with, um, with close friends unless they have some space between them and their friends, you know. So whatever sign you have in the fourth house is going to determine what kind of interaction that person has with their family. And it's not just family like your blood family. It can also refer to close friend groups or uh, a, a professional mentor. It could be like work friends. Whatever uh, planets uh, are wherever in the chart will help determine which one of this it is. The only thing that it's usually a crapshoot <laughs> when you're interpreting a chart is um, if um, when you're reading the signs and planets that are in the fourth house, um, it can be really like a roll of the dice whether or not those um, that energy describes the person's past or their future. Like, is it the way that they were raised, or is it how they plan on raising their kids one day, or is it both? You know. So sometimes um, I can be incorrect because I'll assume that it's like about someone's childhood home, and it's really um, and it's really more about what's what's going to come and, and it's, you know, or, or vice versa. But think of it this way. So this house is what you attract to yourself, who you attract, like what kinds of energy do you bring into your inner circle? 
That's the fourth house. Okay, the fifth house. Fifth house is a little odd because um, you would expect manifestation to fall under the rulership of Mars. Mars is usually the planet of get things done. However, Mars is unguided. Uh, it's more like the desire to do work, but not necessarily the desire to do any particular kind of work. So Mars does govern productivity, uh, but more from the sense of a desire to get things done. Whereas um, the planet, the sun, so the sun is more about actual, like in historically it's represented knowledge, it represents knowing, it represents, you know, um, learning, uh, and also in this case, creating because without the sun there'd be no life you know like the sun has created so much for us so there's this idea of um of creation and it's and the energy of the sun is fixed fire and of leo as well it's fixed fire and leo is a very creative sign so this house um does represent manifestation and work ethic you know getting things done doing things through to completion so wherever mars falls will determine how much someone likes working. If Mars is in Capricorn, they probably are a workaholic. Uh, if Mars is in uh, Pisces, then they probably have a ton of ideas and start a hundred different projects and never finish any of them. But it'll depend, you know, what, what is in the fifth house. If the fifth house has uh, Virgo in it, then then regardless, if Mars is in Pisces and the fifth house has Virgo in it, then I would bet that person is someone who has big dreams and big goals and the follow through to complete them. So that's going to be like an entrepreneurial chart. Um, but it all depends on what is in the rest of the houses uh, and, and what planets are where. So there's no way to really isolate one little part of a chart from the rest but um but generally whatever falls into the fifth house is what a person is going to feel like they can produce um so it's i create but it doesn't just refer to creative efforts though there is an emphasis on creative efforts it also refers to creating a good future for yourself in some way or another uh be it a creative endeavor uh, you know uh writing papers uh being physically fit, okay, physical health is often attributed to, to fire, it's vitality, it's inner, the strength of our inner flame. So, uh, so it's a little odd um, to think about, but it really means the manifestation of anything. So when you say I create, it's not in the sense of like, um, of like the energy of Mars, which is like, I'm starting something, let's see if it ever comes to fruition. It's more like, I created this thing, this thing is done now, because I created it. Okay, so that is this, that is the sense you should think about this sentence and I create. So that's the fifth house. Now we're on to the sixth house. The sixth house is the descendant. I should have put that on the slide. So descendant. So this is the sign that is setting while the rising sign is rising. And so in many ways, it's the opposite of the first um, sign, though many people consider the opposite of the first house to be the seventh house because they're directly opposite. So they're both kind of opposite each other a little bit. Um, and we'll talk more about this idea of looking at opposites uh, as we go through the remaining signs because this uh, sixth house is the last house in the northern hemisphere, in the in the bottom of the chart. So um, the bottom of the chart, the Northern Hemisphere signs, uh, and, they're, and the North is in the South because it it's like a three-dimensional shape. Like it's like what it will look like if you're, you know, looking around. It's that brought into a two-dimensional shape. So so that's why it's drawn a little funky. But, um, but you have uh, the houses go counterclockwise around. And the reason for that is because of um, the perspective of how it look if you actually like one time I, I made a point of visualizing this and it made sense for like 10 minutes before I thought about it too hard again. But, um, but, but anyway, so the Northern Hemisphere signs, uh, you know, um, Aries through Virgo all talk about the, um, 
the self. You know, if someone has a lot of signs or a lot of planets in those signs, um, then they're probably um, a relatively selfish person, which is not necessarily a bad thing, right? Many people uh, struggle to, to keep healthy <laughs> in their own lives. And those would be like younger souls, people who are, are working through some issues. And so that's, there's nothing wrong with those people being selfish because they have a lot to focus on, a lot of work to do, right? So um, it's just different ways of being. But if you have a lot of planets in those signs, then you'll tend to be focused on matters in your own life. So that's why in the first house you have, um, this is me. And then the second house you have, these are my belongings. And then in the third house you have, this is what I look like to people. And then in the fourth house you have, these are the people I want in my life. And then in the fifth you have, this is what I want my life to mean. This is what I want to accomplish. And then in the sixth house you have, and this is how I fit in to the rest of the world, to the rest of the group. So this is the first sign that really transitions from me, me, me to how do I fit in with the greater perspective. And that makes sense because this is mutable earth, right? So this is a waning energy. This is like I'm starting to think less about myself and more about the world at large, more about how I fit into the world. So this one is your service or career or your calling, right? So many people say career, and it is possible for you to like look at this house and a couple of the planets and, and maybe the 10th house and find what someone would be good at, find out what kinds of careers someone might want to do. Like for instance, earlier I pointed out that some, one combination might lend well to entrepreneurship, one might lend well to writing or being a physician or whatever. Um, so that is one component of this house, but the deeper component isn't necessarily what am I actually going to do for a living, but it's what is my calling? What do I desire to do for a living? Um, because the stars are really just a blueprint. Your natal chart is a blueprint. So you can't like look at someone's chart when they're a child and just be like, oh yeah, they're going to be a mason. <laughs> they're going to build walls when they grow up. Like that level of clarity doesn't exist, right? But I could say that, oh, this person should probably focus on their writing or their musicianship because they have a lot of creative signs in their chart. So that might tell a parent to be supportive if their child is, you know, pursuing some kind of um, artistic path because they might actually succeed at it, whereas most people might not, you know? So the, the stars might help you to know if someone is going to be fit for a certain path or another and, and decide how you want to, to best support them. So the sixth house, um, and also it's, it's ruled by Mercury. So Mercury and Venus both rule two houses because there's 10 planets and 12 houses, right? So Mercury rules this one. It also rules um, the third house. So, so while the third house is, you know, expression of self, this one is also expression, but this one's less like expression of my personality and more expression of my skills and abilities, my ability. So they all build on each other, right? So the fifth house is manifestation. So this is um, how do I communicate? my ability to manifest things so that we can all work together. Harmonious collaboration, right? So I collaborate. That's the sixth house. Okay. So now we enter the southern hemisphere and we have the seventh house, Libra, which is ruled by Venus. Uh, so Venus is why you get the theme of relationships, um, you know, in this house. So a lot of people will, will look at this house in order to determine what kind of um, relationships a person is in or should be in. Um, and I use it for that as well. But uh, the higher purpose of this house is really about um, taking all of the experiences from the previous six signs and bringing them together. So like, you know, so you learned who you are, you learned uh, what things you need to, to live. You learned how to express yourself. You learned what family members you wanted to surround you. You learned how to get things done. You learned how to help others get things done and how to be productive in a group setting. Now you can take all of those experiences and give back. And this is where you start to see the, the, um, the opposites, right? So this is an opposition to the first house. Uh, and the sixth is, is some people consider the sixth to be an opposition because uh, it's the descendant. But um, this one is truly completely opposite the first house. So 180 degrees, right? So this is the real opposite. So um, you can think about it like the first house is I am who I am. You know, this is I am 
me. This is who I am. And this house is like, um, I am based on all of the experiences I've had in the past. And how do I take all of the collect, the things I've collected experience wise and give that back? Um, so this is, you know, I learn and teach, right? So I have learned and I will teach is really the energy of this, of this house. Um, and so that does apply to relationships of all kinds. You know, this is how you interact with the people around you, uh, how you collaborate with them, um, all based on your past experience. Uh, and because it's ruled by Venus, there is a direct component of love. So there's a lot of different um, applications for the seventh house. If you think about it, that makes sense because Libra is cardinal air. So this is a very complex house. It's very dynamic. Um, so that's, that makes sense because that's, that's the nature of air. So, okay. The eighth house. So the eighth house is the first house that is ruled by two zodiacal signs. Um, up until mm, maybe a thousand years ago, um, Ophicus was on the, the ecliptic for like a week and Scorpio was like two or three weeks. Um, but as the ecliptic path shifted and the and the way the planets actually travel in the sky moved now scorpio is really only about a week and ophicus is like two or three weeks so you have to consider ophicus now um when it comes to what planets are where if the sun is in ophicus that does mean something distinctly different than if the sun is in scorpio and scorpio has been lauded as a sign of transformation for a long time and I don't think that's right. I think what happened is people were looking at the energy of Scorpio and Ophicus side by side without realizing it and they were saying oh well um, you know some Scorpios are very basic primal people some Scorpios uh, rise above that like the eagle and um, and are very you know are less petty and about this and, and learn to manipulate people very profoundly. And then you have the next level above that, uh, the phoenix, they say, which um, has learned how to, uh, instead of just stinging someone instinctively when something bad happens, uh, the phoenix learns to take that anguish, transform it into something good, and then send it back out. That's a little silly, in my opinion. From my experience, and I've done hundreds of charts professionally, Scorpios are tend to be very primal people period they're very primal they they act on their uh their intuition they act on whatever uh they just feel is right instinct intuition that's what they're ruled by it's fixed water okay so it's very instinctual it's very emotional but but emotional in um in a less deep way than than uh Pisces right so it's it's very like um and and then people always say like oh well Scorpio is the most fiery water sign people always think it's a fire sign but that energy is not that energy that component of that fiery is really chaos and it's coming from Ophicus Ophicus is the imp the epitome of chaos so I think I talk about the difference between these two a little bit in um in the actual um video on the zodiacal signs but uh, for th for the purposes of this. Uh, the house lecture. Just consider that the energy of Scorpio and Ophicus both influence the eighth house. So it doesn't matter at this point if uh, Scorpio has three stages and embodies transformation or if that's really just, you know, people looking at two signs and thinking it's one. That doesn't really matter because in this case, both of that, those energies are real here. So in this house, you have the theme of transformation. You have the theme of endings and new beginnings, uh, rebirth, right? So um, think of the watery water, the womb of the world, right? Like that's what we're talking about here. We're talking about, and, and Ophicus embodies chaos um, and, and really chaotic bad, um, because Ophicus was a jealous sea serpent that stole a woman and held her hostage until he was murdered. So, <laughs> um, we're, we're talking chaos bad here. Uh, and, and that's in line with Scorpio, the energy of Scorpio also, which tends to be very manipulative. Um, and it's not always a bad thing to pull from those types of energies, right? It's, it's not about the energy itself. It's about how it's used. It's about the intent. 
Um, so this sign is very spiritual. It's the divine will manifested into everyday life. Okay, that's the influence of Ophicus. The transformation, that's Ophicus. Um, the restlessness, uh, that, you know, um, wanting to move forward uh, and challenge yourself, that's all the influence of Ophicus. And that's why the eighth house really embodies your life's, you know, kind of like, not your life's journey, because that's more like the ninth one. Okay, so if you think about going back to what I said, the opposite. So the opposite of the eighth house is the second house. And the second house is all about um, what you have taken possession of. Um, so this house is like, um, I've taken possession of all of these little things. Now, how do I transform um, all of these things that that belong to me in a way that benefits, you know, either myself or the world around me more. So this is like, how do I take all of the things that I have and do something with them? And that's where the theme of transformation comes in. And so you see like that can be a selfless, that can be a selfish thing or a selfless one. So um, Scorpio by itself doesn't indicate whether or not a person is a good or a bad person. But Scorpios do tend to be manipulative, which many people don't like. So it depends. And it depends on how they use their manipulative abilities. Um, but whatever sign falls into the eighth house, that is going to describe the way that a person um, applies all of the knowledge and skills and everything that they've learned so think again like it's a progression so in the previous one you want to have in the previous one you have I learn and teach and this one you have how does my efforts of learning and teaching change myself and the world around me that's the energy of the eighth house so I think I think that covers I think that covers it it's a very complicated one as you get into the higher houses they become more and more complex Okay, so the ninth house, the ninth house is um, Sagittarius. It's ruled by the planet Jupiter, so it has the energy of mutable fire. Um, the ninth house also it lies opposite of the third house in the flat wheel. Um, so, um, if you think the third house is like self-expression, uh, you know, like how do I want people to see me? Uh, then the ninth house is uh, how do people actually see me? Um, how do people come into my life? How do I extend all of the lessons that I've learned? Uh, how do I take the energy from the previous house, that element of transformation, and apply it um, so that I progress along my path, along my journey? So you really can't see that this is a spectrum, right? So in the previous house, it was like setting you up and I almost wanted to say it, it's it's setting you up for that feeling of, I need to do something with my life. Okay, that's just, that's the feeling of the seventh, or sorry, of the eighth house. That's the feeling. I need to do something with my life. I need to transform everything that's happened to me and make it meaningful. So now in the ninth house, it's like, how have you made it meaningful? Now that you've, now that you've tried to make it meaningful, is it? Has it worked? <laughs> so um, in the ninth house, you find what do people actually do? You know, um, you, how do they actually act? Um, how did, what lessons have they actually learned? Uh, where has their journey taken them? And what do they choose to share with the people around them? So the sentence is, I extend. So again, this is this is a house of expression, just like the opposition, just like the third house. But this time, it's um, you're now expressing yourself for the benefit of others. I'm extending my hand to someone to help them up, right? An extension, not necessarily just this is who I am. Do you like me? <laughs> Do you like me? <laughs> That's the third house. The ninth house is here. I think this might actually really help you. <laughs> so. That's the difference. Okay, now we're finally getting into the last quadrant. Tenth house. So the tenth house is your public status. Um, this is ruled by Capricorn, uh, the planet Saturn. So it has that cardinal energy. It's cardinal Earth. Um, so it's really like... Um, what seeds am I planting that will continue to grow after I've gone, after I've left? That's the energy of this house, of the cardinal earth. Like think of like a budding seed that you plant in the ground and then 
you move away and years later you come back and it's grown into a huge oak tree you know the oak tree would be whatever is whatever the sign in the 10th house is describes what that oak tree is you know uh, what is your legacy what have you achieved what do people know you for um it's it's all the accumulated efforts right if it builds on the rest so it's all the accumulated efforts that you extended out to other people and now it's like how did they feel when you extended the hand to help them did they like that did that benefit them could you have done it better you know that's the 10th house so i am as they see me that's this one so it's i am again but this time it's i am um in the public eye like who i am as as everyone else thinks i am so that's number 10 okay number 11 we have fixed air this is the house ruled by aquarius and the planet uranus um so it represents philosophies and values right that that aligns with air um it's your opinions um, rather, it's not just your opinions, but it's how your opinions and actions come together to form a path forward. So with Aquarius, um, you're not just thinking like, uh, what do I think about the world? But you're saying, how do I take what I think about the world plus what they think about me and my ability to influence them? So that's the 10th house plus the lessons that I can extend to them. So that's the 9th house plus, you know, and it goes all the way back. So you're taking all of the things that you have under your belt in your spiritual toolkit you're taking all of those things and you're forming them together with your perspective with your um philosophies to create some kind of ideal or standard that you'll either live by or that you'll help others to live by um, something concrete that actually moves the world forward um, so that's why the word for this one the sentence for this one is i formulate right so now you're now you're calculating the best way to bring all of your past experiences together and finally the 12th house this one is ruled by pisces and cetus so this is the second house that has two signs that rule it um so the 12th house is mutable water it's very like dark dynamic type of environment it also has some components from spirit and chaotic good right so cetus is also chaos it's like chaos embodied it's another sea serpent but in this case um the sea serpent didn't like isn't known for having done anything horrible right so it's just a misunderstood creature of the deep <laughs> if you will so so in this case um you have that chaos but you also have the um an innocent component to it so chaotic bad would be like um you know your car explodes suddenly for no reason right but chaotic good would be like um you were trying to get pregnant and or you wanted to get pregnant but you knew you shouldn't so you were taking birth control pills but the birth control failed so now you're pregnant and you're like well i didn't know if i really you know well i was trying not to but i wanted this so that's a good thing <laughs> so it's really chaotic good so um you know that would be an example of chaotic good like the foundation of life is chaotic good you know the fact that cells race each other to come together to then grow into many many more cells and if any tiny thing goes wrong anywhere along the process and then it's all aborted and that's it and it's you know screw screw the pooch and and that person that may have come to life uh, is not going to exist now and and every single person that ever you know comes to life plays some intricate role in some grand plan so you know that's that's all chaos interacting with each other and that's all chaos good because we're talking about life and creating life so that's the energy of Cetus. And Cetus is, I didn't include Cetus in my zodiacal um, lecture because uh, the planets don't spend very much time in Cetus, it, except when you're in the southern hemisphere. And I haven't fully characterized it. The one thing that I know about Cetus is that it has a lot of galaxies like um, from out, it has a lot of galaxies, not, not star systems within our galaxy, but you can actually see galaxies when you look into that constellation in the direction of that constellation in the sky um and so i postulated when i noticed that at first when this first came up um that somebody who had like a cetus sun sign or a cetus you know you know cetus can't be rising by itself it's, it would both be pisces and cetus rising 
um, but somebody who had prominent cetus placement in their chart might be a star child. So that's what I postulated. And then I have since met a, a couple people that have prominent cetus placement, and they all are star child children. So everyone who has a planet in Cetus, except Eris, which is always in Cetus, basically, uh, it moves out of Cetus in like 4,000 years. So, um, But everyone who has a planet in Cetus, um, like a significant placement of that constellation, I think is a star child. And what that means is that they lived their past lives on another planet in another star system somewhere else in the, in the universe or in the galaxy. They're not from Earth. Their soul is not from Earth, which can happen. It's rare, but it does happen. And those people tend to be aloof and um, and they struggle to understand basic customs and they tend to be the black sheep uh, and they don't really fit in everywhere they go and it's always a struggle for them to fit in. So that's the energy of Cetus really. Um, so far, as far as I know, there might be there might be more to it. It's the newest sign in the zodiac. Uh, there's no saying how long it'll remain in the zodiac. It might it might leave the zodiac at some point um, because it depends on on planetary procession and I don't I don't know where we're headed I'd have to sit down and figure that out so but it's uh it is something worth knowing about even if you typically ignore it in charts uh, and Eris as well is worth knowing about for the retrogrades um, as we'll talk about in a coming lecture there are other applications of astrology besides natal charts um, so whether or not Eris was retrograde at the time of someone's birth will indicate how much of a role chaos plays in their life among other things for instance having two rising signs um, having a, um, pl many planets that are on the cusp of multiple signs or houses. Uh, on the cusp means that it's in between. It's it's um, so like my sun sign, which we'll see when I do the examples, is in between Virgo and Leo, like exactly in between. So I'm I'm a cusp baby. I have uh, I have both Virgoian and uh, Leo uh, traits when it comes to my conscious mind and my in the way that people see me in the way I interact with the world, which in case that's not obvious, <laughs> I'm a creative analytical blend. I'm a creative problem solver. Um, so that is the result of my being on the cusp. So lots of people have cusps and stuff like that. So I'm on the cusp. Uh, my sun sign is on the cusp. My rising is on the cusp and Eris was retrograde at the time of birth. So I have like all of the signs of chaos in my life, right? So um, I'm a very chaotic being and I work with chaos. Um, so lots of people might, you know, that might indicate something for other people as well. Lots of people might have this alignment as well. It's it's rare to find so many cusps and so many retrogrades in a chart. You'll see. <laughs> but um, that's why I like to use my chart as an example because it's very complicated. So if you can read my chart, you can probably read most charts. <laughs> um, I struggle with like, um, with a couple signs, which I'll, which I'll talk about when we do the examples. But so the 12th house ruled by Pisces, the wateriest of water signs uh, and Cetus. Well, it's not really the wateriest, right? It's kind of like airy. It's it's in it's in the quadrant of air. So Pisces is the water of air. It's very uh, dreamy and uh, and peaceful uh, and selfless. And so that's why this sign represents giving unconditional and unstructured chaotic good okay so giving for the sake of giving not because it makes you feel good uh, but just because you feel compelled compelled to do it or it needs to get done you know for some other reason it represents wisdom drawn from all of the other aspects of life like all the other houses right so this house is when you um, you're returning to a state of thinking about yourself right because it's mutable it's leading into the southern hemisphere so you're thinking about yourself but this time you're thinking about uh how do i um you know what about myself uh lends best to giving to to returning uh what i have been given in my life to returning that threefold right so the idea of karma what do I do? How do I go about um, considering considering all the lessons that I have learned in the past? How does that define me? And uh, and how do I give all of this back to the world now that I'm retiring from it? That's like what the twelfth house would embody. So it's very 
it's very complicated, interesting kind of energy. And that's why the statement, I distribute, doesn't always make sense, okay? Because, um, because if you're thinking about it, you're thinking like, well, introspection, internalization, what does it have to do with giving back? Um, but this house is like uh, not necessarily giving back for the same, you know, not giving back in the same sense as the service, right? So the, think of the opposition to the 12th house as the 6th house. So in the 6th house, you're like, how can I best collaborate? How do I take all of the past experiences, all these skills, how do I take my ability to manifest things and um, interact with other people so that something comes of that? That's about how do I fit in to this group, to the world, to whatever. The 12th house, now you're not saying that. You're saying you know how you fit in, right? You know you know how you fit in. You know how people see you. You know what your legacy is. You know um, how to, um, you know how that legacy is going to come together with your opinions to, um, you know, you know you've, you've formulated the best way for you to make your mark on the world and this is how you actually go about making it. This is like the sage who sits around and, and just tells people about their experiences and, and their wisdom and, um, and, and spends the rest of their time just considering their past experiences and, and maybe how those experiences could benefit other people as well. Um, so it's it's a very interesting dynamic kind of energy. Um, the 12th house is about um, your spirituality as, as well and like how you give back to divinity, how you give thanks, like how do you relate to deity also. So for instance, if someone has Aries in the 12th house or Scorpio, then they are probably uh, a more primal person. They are very instinctual. They wouldn't necessarily um, spend hours and hours considering um, what is God and what's the best way to give back to God. They would just do what they felt was right and operate on instinct or intuition uh, more than any kind of thought process or, or feeling. Because it's not even like they're saying um, this feels right to me. That's too much thought even. Even that's too much thought. Them asking themselves, well, what feels right to me? That's something I'd expect from like a cancer in the 12th house or maybe Sagittarius, something. I don't know. Um, so what, what, what like an Aries in the 12th house would be like um, just acting. They would give no thought to their spirituality at all. <laughs> so maybe like a satanic type path or something like that. So Definitely depends on the location of the other planets also. <laughs> Just trying to think of examples off the top of my head. So if you look at this uh, all together, uh, you can see the opposites um, more obviously. And uh, it, can help, it can help you to visualize these different energies. So you have, you know, I collaborate versus I distribute. So you can see like one of them is you're giving back. Um, and, and seeing how you fit in. And the other one is you're giving back regardless of how you fit in. It does, it's not about you anymore. You know, now it's just, this is what I have to offer. Um, so you can see how these things all interact with each other. And this is a good chart to copy down into like a book of shadows. So that's it. That's the houses. Um, so, so next time we'll talk about the aspects. Uh, and then we're going to do a couple examples um, and read the natal charts from start to finish. So that one might be a longer one. And then in the last lecture, I'm just going to talk about some of the different uh, types of astrology. Just give an overview. Um, I'm going to teach electional divination and medical, um, and I'm going to do it all in one class. So there's really only there's really only three lectures left after this one. The one on aspects, the examples, and kind of like a for your information, further reading type lecture. <laughs> so 
Okay, so I hope that you guys enjoyed this and that this was helpful. Um, and if you have any questions, always like usual, please feel free to email us, Covenant of the Open Mind at gmail.com or drop a comment from everyone here at the Covenant of the Open Mind. Blessed be.